hele aminers in haar maag of in haar stomach. Some men had had meer than enough, and some men went back, and there was what fun with the went, and they got a name that would stick to them all their life. They were cried scabs. And that stuck to them. And they, out in the bin that, were liable to get their windows smashed. Some men, they, they, they had to work with their loners because people wouldn't speak to them. Connell Park was the largest of the mining villages in New Cumnock. At its peak, it was home to 1,200 people. Well, it, it was more or less again built for the miners, miners' rows. There were Stepens Road, Long Row, and there were the Store Row, and there were the Bog Road, and then there were the Honeymoon. The reason it got that name, it was honeymoon couples that went into the houses at that time, you see. That was an end. There were more or less the houses and the, the main road, which they called the Bank Bray. In the 20s and 30s, families from Spain came looking for work. Geraldi, Barrera and many more. Well, Jimmy Lopez, the man I'm golfer, he came from Spain and he settled in Ucumna. Well, I was born in Burnside, but I was, I was actually reared in Cornell Park. And the, the, the houses, in part of the house that we lived in in Cornell Park, store all, there weren't there were no water in the house. But to go to a pump, and that's the way you got a lot of red faced wains going to school. Oh, they're fine and can, can hold the pump well other than wash cold water, you can. The supply of fresh water to the town was eventually solved with the opening of the Glen Afton Reservoir in 1935. The lab lighters became redundant when gas was replaced by electricity. Complaints and objections from religious groups arose when Biddle's cinema began showing films on Sundays in 1938. Small changes to the lives of the people of New Cumnock were about to be overshadowed by an event which would change the world. See, the house is in North Mew here. They were in Sister Venice there. Well, when the war broke out, they started them days before the war broke out. And they, they had them all built up. They only needed to put a riff on it. And they had to stop. All oh, work had done to stop. Well, see, when the war started, uh -huh. they, they, they rounded all oh, the Italians up and did them away and put them in camps. We joke the Italian time, uh -huh. mind him. Mm -hmm. They turned them away in the, the, the rector shops, the structure shops, all this stuff they had. You'd, you'd bear these different, different things today. If the, if the, the, if the enemy was attacking you, well, you'd do good and, and see there were no licks. Oh, that could have worked. We were landing anywhere in France where we possibly could land. Um, because the, a farm, a farmer's field was an obvious place, and I went and saw the farm lady. She said, "Have you anything that we, I can make the dinner with?" Oh, and she gave me some tatties and some eggs. So I was busy making, and I was boiling the eggs in a tin helmet. We had a raid. The Germans came and raided the field we were in. There was a bomb landed, and up went my dinner, tin helmet and all. Three or four hundred feet in the air. <laughs> that was it. But there was a German aircraft uh, had flown up, right up the, down the valley, and they actually dropped a bomb in Kirkconnell Station, uh, next to Kirkconnell Station. And Lord Haw Haw claimed that night that an important rail junction in the southwest of Scotland had been destroyed. But uh, they actually blew the gable in at the cooperative down there and, and killed somebody's pet rabbit. During the war time, near where the Scottish farm, that big house, the toll, well, down, the, down that bray there, there was a big hut. It belonged to the bullers. And that's where they held the dances in the, in the summer, during the war. And <laughs> I'll tell you, we'd want to get next. <laughs> and when it showed the news, you mind when it showed the news, 
at the picture house, and Hitler come on, boo, <laughs> and then when Hitler come on, hooray! <laughs> She, 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 she uses it with often driving on. Uh -huh. It was prison reward that came for Penelin's Com in the right. overlay oh, wow. that, that made all the funds for them. Right. That's what it was. They did, they did all the, the heavy work. There was one old guy, uh, he was all to me, like Henrik, and I really liked him. Like, and uh, he was a German. And uh, some great times for him. And he was there at the end of the war. Uh -huh. I can always remember the day the war finished. Uh, church would come on the radio at night, you know, and Henrik had been taken away back to the camp by this time. And in the morning when he came in, he hadn't a clue that the war was finished. I don't know how it was, but none of them knew. They must, they must have said, well, if we tell them, they'll no go to the war. And I, I've since written about the George McClatchy, who was a, a rear gunner on a Lancaster, and it, it, no impressive, it's quite sad. He had, he had to do 30 operations and he was lost on the last operation. Uh, really, that, that was that was a bit touching. After, after the war, in fact, again, everything seemed to just bloom up. The, the, all the, the houses, it was only half built. They come and finish them off, didn't they know what they were doing? They just started again, a riff, a riff on. The housing immediately after the Second World War, when the Southern Bridgend area was developed and people moved from Burnfoot, Craigbank and Connell Park, that, that was a big change to the village instead of being so scattered. And we came to Connell Park too when I was in dry. Yes. Brand new houses, hot and cold water, oh, we thought we were having all great stuff. Hellish, I'm not going to say it, but I, I thought it was the most office place I'd ever seen in my life. Why was that? What was your first time? I don't know, it was just that I, I, thought, I thought there was that rough, oh, so there was sure. really rough. Yeah, yeah. The place, it was a wee attic, we was moving mm -hmm. into a wee attic. Mm -hmm. There was five, five of us and my mum, mm -hmm. which made six in this tiny wee attic. There was no sanitation and no kind. There was no running water, but to cross the, the road eh, about 100 years to, to get a pail of water. There was no toilets and no kind. Yes, they go to kind of folk I realised they wasn't just as rough as I thought they was. I mean, yeah. my first job, but now I'm not long way on. Mm -hmm. We were bathing the after, mm -hmm. the after the hotel. And she then two for the price of yen. She got two for the price of one, a pound mm -hmm. for the two, yes. <laughs> my first job was at a fair, a gated mm -hmm. fair. And the, the first thing I did when I got up was I let the bile up to heat the water for the steam for to wash the dairy. And after that, I did, I went up and let the hens out. I come back and chucked the porridge pot on and stuck it right. back into the buyer and carried the milk into the machine. And after that, it was breakfast time. Got my breakfast, went back out and stared it to the dairy dish. Yes. It went in and washed out the kitchen flare, the scullery flare, the boiler room flare, all these things. It arrived in the morning about five o'clock to do the milk. Then, after you had the mil milk it, you had to yoke a horse with a cart and go to, you come up for the milk. That was just, that was just there. But I think it was the ambition of the every, I would say, 95% of the boys that was at the skill was to get left to skill and start working the pit. You were a wee bit apprehensive, Ken, getting in the cage. You didn't just, Ken, what was going to happen, especially when it dropped, Ken. You were a wee bit fear. I go what I didn't expect. Ken, I had my mind made up what it would be like down there. What did you think it was going to be like? Well, I thought it was going to be a big dark dungeon. Mm -hmm. But it was, mate. No, for the first. But especially with the pit bottom, the, the lights all over the place. Uh -huh. Do you get to the cold face? And then you, you depend on your, your lamp right. after that. It got to be that uh, it got more kind of fearsome as, to, as the run uh, progressed because the roads began to sit down and it got to be latterly that you were crawling in these roads with your supplies where a, a forehorn you could walk. Your brother was at the call. He might have to call and you get him on the phone and you take the bogies out to the main road. And it was always wide. You're always wide to the knees. The shift to start away when I started in the pit was seven in the morning to half past two, with 20 minutes for your piece, for 10 to 20 past. That was your piece time. One 20 minute break in the whole One day? One 20 minute break. 
that was that. My wage, previous to working with my dad, was about four pound nine something yeah. as a wood boy, and that was hard work, wood boy. When I went with my dad, my wage was about eighteen pound. But that week, after working with my dad, my mother gave me to put the tires in, my mouth was like I'm home. I was like, tired, but it only took me a week to harden up there. The doctor usually stayed in the house and helped the mother to look after all the sons that was uh -huh. working. And they brought in the wages kind of style. So that the one that really, uh, the, the place for women was in the home kind of style, looking after the men. Every, every house that I came had what they cried a pet chair. Right. That was where you put the pet clears in the fire. They were ice soaking water. Uh -huh. If it wasn't water, it was sweat. And the hunger in the boot there, and then when they dried, your mother or your sister or somebody took them out to the house and belted them off the wall. Yeah. They know the stuff and scraped your pit bits. A miner worked one shift a day. A miner's wife worked uh, three shifts a day if you came up me around the clock, especially when her family set it working. So what I used to do, I've, when I was a boy, I can wheel my mother shouting, here they're coming, go and put that chair out. They sat the chair out of the bar door and somebody picked up and by and had a dance down there. Entertainment, I know. They used to cut each other's hair and cobble their bits. Believe it if you like, it was a, it was a common belief that men didn't wash their bark at waking their bark. <laughs> so if you saw men cycling that was minors, you could be assured everything as far as it would be as white as could be and as clean as could be, but the bark it was black <laughs> with a trademark at the... Aye, certainly. Yeah, that's true. Cold uh, dust. With a cold dust. <laughs> because it, mm. it was a, a fun belief, it wakened their barks. I mean, you had wee thriving communities in the likes of Cono Park itself, the bank itself, and Burnfoot. They were all wee individual communities with their own kind of life and, and, and neighbours and friends. And I mean, the likes of Pathid, the castle, doing the burn. It was a, sometimes great, the different attitudes they had. The folk for doing the burn and the folk for brigade really had nothing in common. <laughs> Each hamlet had one thing in common, coal mining. Uh, there was an atmosphere. It was all heavy hairs. There was hardly a farm than you come look. But there was no effect it with it. Between that shin of firm and the graveyard, there was a shortcut that would get across. And to the right of that shortcut, there was a moss or a peat field there. And there was torrential rain. Torrential rain. And uh, it happened on my birthday. That's right. The 7th of September, 1950, it happened. That was my 16th birthday. Oh, I remember it. A brother worked along with me and wore we were going pretty well that night. We were trying to fill extra hutches so as we could get up an early shift on the Friday. And uh, just a bit pissed him. It was taking a while to come back with a hutch, you see. So I went away out to see and went up the duke to see what was hod the hod up. And it was then that the lights all went out. It was as if a plug had been drawn. They caught too near it, mm. and it was like drawing a plug, and that just floated in, rushed in. So, and then with that, Andrew Houston, who was in charge of the pit, the full pit, he ran by us, and I asked him if there was something wrong. Well, he didn't answer me, you see. He was going to the phone. The phone was working, which was, to me, was a miracle. But we fall out of mutant, and that's when we discovered there'd been a cave in. The pit hole went, I think it must have went about five or six times, and that's when the fault when you come like in or something wrong. And the stuff was coming in the mine gradually and shoving a locomotive with about 30 hatches on it. It was shoving them in the, the road. Then the air began to get deteriorate, so we're all more or less confined to a, an area which wouldn't be much bigger than the wee bit bigger maybe in the room here, twice the size of the room. We're all confined to that area mm -hmm. and there were gas in the east side, gas on the other side 
and gas above us. A, a rail trap to the edge of the crater and all kinds of rubbish including trees, hay, hutches were sent down this rail into the crater to try and stop any more stuff from Bring going down. down. They put these uh, straws into the tubs and run them down into that hole and then there were none left. So they gave us the axes and saws in the store they sent us up to see first. There was a wee wood out there. Mm -hmm. And we cut down every tree that was in it. And that was during the night. And when it got light, and I saw where we'd been working, I think I turned with every colour and uh -huh. under the sun. I think uh, because there was such a big crowd of men that uh, you didn't think so much of it are we going to get out? Will we get out? I mean, it seemed to be a way for your thoughts. Somebody maybe tell a story and maybe somebody sung again. And one of the best was Dave Jess. I mean, he kept the thing going. I'll give you an instance. One of the times he took uh, a man by the name of Jimmy Carmichael, and Jimmy was a wee man, you see, and he took Jimmy and sat him in his knee and he was using him as a ventriloquist dummy. They asked me to sing again. Okay. So, I mean, being a, a Christian, I sung the old rugged cross. They could hear it through the phone up on the, the surface. And of course, by that time, there was reporters and whatever, and photo photographers, oh, and this big grossly fat photographer come along to us one day and he says, I'll give any of you lads half a crown to carry my gear <laughs> up to the top of the washer bing. He'd to run for his life. The rescue brigade men, they come down and they brought these salvers through and showed us who to work them. Then there was young man, he again collapsed. We can't, when we get word that he had got through, with a rescue brigade taking them in a stretcher, that they were hope for us. Oh, Juan Caracida. Oh, fine. First man to come through. Right. Mm-hmm. Fucking state was in. It was all right. And I had the old bad stuff. There were only half an hour's oxygen in these apparatus, so we had to be through that in half an half hour. hour. They were beginning to get a wee bit hurried. There'd maybe be a brigade man in the front and maybe in and between us. First thing you seen when you got out through was a doctor. And then you were escorted to the pit head into an ambulance away to Bull of Mail. There were, there was two men were were trapped were they were trapped in, but they were there. They lived for about ten days after the the inrush. That was Johnny Dale and, and Willie Howitt. Willie Howitt. Uh, they 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 were in the road up to finish their work and. <laughs> One of the men had forgot his jacket and he got away back to get it. 